All right. Thank you, Dr. Lauder, for notifying you. I keep on forgetting that. So, all right. So, let us uh, start today's uh, lecture. And uh, all the other slides, I basically uh, hide it. So, let's directly go to our uh slides on array so let's start from so what i will do i have again several google collab ready and i will just switch back and forth between my powerpoints and google collab so uh instead of going to the slideshow mode i think it will be better if i just uh directly jump here so here first today we will start with python arrays but before going to that any question from the last week or anything All right, so if you do not have any question, uh, then let's uh, start learning about arrays. So first of all, what is the general meaning of an array? Array is basically an identifier that can store many data items under the same variable name. For example, just, see, just think about a situation uh, where let's say you got a very popular restaurant uh, in the town and uh, there is a long queue to have breakfast every morning. So, uh, there is one receptionist who is managing that long queue so there are two different options for the receptionist let's say the receptionist needs to know the name of each individual that is standing on the queue and tell them that all right alice go to the end of the queue or bob come to the front of the queue or uh charles go to the go to this position of the queue something like that this is one way of managing but this way the receptionists need to know the name of each individual person but the other way of the reception is to how the receptionist can manage the queue is uh, the receptionist can just tell that all right person one in the queue go to go to the end or person two in the queue come to the front or person three in the queue go to the middle of the queue something like that so here what the receptionist is doing the receptionist instead of utilizing the individual name the receptionist is using the same name called person and then just using one index in the queue where the person is standing currently and then by using that same name person and that index the receptionist is managing the queue that's exactly the concept of array in programming in array uh, you can store many data items under the same variable name for convenience so now let us see uh, in python basically there are the few different types of arrays and basically this type of arrays made python uh, so popular for data science because data means you can say a collection of objects and python supports lots of different types of uh, array so uh, the first type of uh, array is called the list in python which is the most basic type of array uh, then uh, the other type of arrays are like uh, uh, tuple which are basically immutable list the other things is uh, set which is an unindexed list and everything uh, i will show you uh, with hands on in a few moment and the other type of list is kind of array is dictionary which is kind of a key value type of list so without uh, going too much onto these uh, slides let's uh, start uh, working uh, practically so let me switch to my google collab and here i have a collab called uh, python arrays so here again just like the last lecture you can uh, just cop uh, type the code with me and uh, to get the output so thanks dr lawler for sharing the code it's on the uh, chat window now um, so uh, this is how you can create a google collab and uh, so once again if you are joined if you do not know how to open collab uh, just go to google collab and just click on this new collab uh, and it will open a jupyter style notebook over here where you can write 
So here, the first thing first, so here I have one variable called person. And instead of so far in the last lecture, whatever variable we have used, we just used like, let's say var equals two or var equals, uh, let's say just Alice. So only one name or only one data item we have stored in the variable, uh, in any variable. But here, as you can see, we have stored many data items under the same variable name. And here, basically, we have stored it inside a box bracket and in a comma separated fashion, which means basically this is a list in Python. So, and just to give we get the idea, like if you just print the type of this uh, person, we can easily see that, well, it is taking a couple of minutes and it is a class called list. So this entire thing. Now, if you want to utilize uh, access one of the element, then just like the Q example that I have told, you have to use the same name, the variable name here, and then you have to uh, access the item with an index. So here, what I am trying, I am trying to access the element at index one. And if I just run this program, it is printing Bob. Now, if you are new to programming, then you can think of like why it is printing Bob if or one, but not Alice, which is the actual first element. Now, just to give you the idea, in any programming language, well, uh, I must say the most of the programming language, indexing starts from zero, not one. So if you want to get the actual first element, or sometimes we call it the zeroth element, then you have to type person zero. And if you run it, then it will give you Alice over here. And similarly, uh, if you want to print Cindy, it will be zero, one, two, something like that in here. So it will print Cindy. So any question? So that's the basic type of list in Python. Now, uh, e now this Python is really made for uh, everyone so that uh, to make everything easy, a Python list can support any type of data item in it. So if you are coming from C++ or Java background, you may find it a little bit weird because their list or array means it's always a homogeneous data type. But here you can store many different types of data item. As you can see in here, this my list is a list where the first element is basically a string. The second one is an integer. The third one is a floating point number. The fourth one is a Boolean number. And there is a fifth one, which is again a string where I, where I just duplicated an element like this. Uh, why I have used this duplicated item, I will talk later, uh, but uh, just uh, remember that a list can have a duplicate item like this. So if I just run this program, uh, the first line will basically print the entire list like this. And the next few lines, the next line will print the type basically of the list, which is class list. And then the last four lines of codes basically is printing different types of all these elements. So the first one is printing the type of the, for, I mean, uh, one eighth element, then two eighth element like this way. So if I just run it and I forgot to type this, uh, yeah. So uh, I think we should go here and now everything is in place. So now if I just run it, you will see the first element is the entire list is this and uh, it is class of list type and its data type is list and the zeroth element has a data type string because it is Alice. The next element is an integer because it is 22. The next element is float, which is 900.45. And the next element is Boolean, which is true. I just omitted the last element because it is a duplicate. So any question regarding this list and the data type that it can handle?
so this is the concept of list so let's uh, take like a few seconds to type all these things uh, and then i am going to the next type of uh, next thing so all right uh, if you are done with typing let's uh, look at some of the characteristics of the list so here basically the point is you can modify a list element at any point of time here i have seen like uh, well if you want to print uh, an element you can just use this uh, person to or with this index if you want to modify an element just what you have to do you just type this access so access the element with the index let's say my list and it's uh, in element at index 3 you want to modify so you did like 3 and then the value that you want to put inside that element uh, inside that uh, index so here it is the element at index 3 have been changed from boolean true to uh, string bob over here as you can see in here so as you can see, list can be modified. And uh, since Python is dynamically typed, uh, you can change from any data type to any other data type uh, dynamically uh, without any error or anything. So are you, so just take a few moments to understand what is happening with a list and then we will move to the, ne move to the next data structure, which is called tuple. So, and please feel free to ask me any question if you have in list. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. So when we go print person item zero up above, we get Alice with no quotations about around it. But on this last one, when we print the list, we get Alice and Bob with a single quote around it. What's going on there? uh which one in, so, in here oh yep. in here mm -hmm. oh all right so here it is printing the entire list all together this is coming from this print my list okay mm -hmm. so that's why when it will print so it is python interpreter's responsibility to show each of the element what type it is. And just to distinguish it, Python interpreter takes this visualization that it okay. uh, do it inside uh, a single code. But okay. if you just type one element like in here, print my list, let's say zero. And if you just type it, it thinks that all right you already know what is the data type and just print it like this okay thank you okay any other question all right so let's uh, move to the new uh, data type which is tuple now tuple is basically just immutable list nothing more to add in it so once you will initialize a list you cannot change it anymore so here i just uh, hear the list this my list and this my tuple uh, basically they all have the same element like alice 22 900.45 and then true and the only difference is list is uh enclosed within a box bracket whereas tuple is enclosed within a parenthesis and by this syntactical change python interpreter uh, realized that well this is a tuple not a list and uh, once again just by the just uh, as you did for the list uh, you can print the tuple by using this print statement my tuple which printed this entire tuple uh, within enclosed within parenthesis you can understand that this is a tuple the only difference is if you want to change any item over here, let's say the third item from true to Bob, uh, you will end up in an error because tuple is immutable and tuple object does not support item assignment afterwards. So that's the only change, only difference between list and tuple. So any question on tuple? 
All right. So that's uh, another data structure, another array type data structure. The other array type data structure is SAPT, which is basically a mathematical data structure to perform some of the statistical operation. We are, excuse me, we are not going into the detail of this mathematical operation, but we will focus on the programming context of it. So just to give you that idea that SAPT is basically an unordered list with unique values. Set do not uh, allow any duplicated element. I'm going to show you a demo in a few minutes. And also the other thing is set can, since it is an unordered list with unique values, it cannot be accessed using numerical index, like what we did for person one, person three. You cannot access a set like that. That's the difference. So here again, this my set, again, it has the similar content like Alice 22, 900.45 and true, but this time it is enclosed within a curly braces by which the Python interpreter understand this is a set, not list or tuple. And here again, if you just use my set, it will print the entire uh, set together. But if you want to access the element, something like this, what you have done for list or tuple, uh, you will end up in an error because set object is not subscriptable. So because it is unordered. So that's the difference between list and tuple and set. Now everything is okay because I commented out this line. So any question regarding set, I mean, the basic philosophy, fundamental philosophy of set and the differences. All right, so if you are done with uh, typing uh, and uh, well, if you find that, well, uh, I'm moving so fast, please feel free to let me know. I will just go a little bit uh, slower if you do not get much time for printing or anything. Uh, because I already have all the code ready, so I'm just explaining, right? So um, anyway, so here are some more properties of a set. Uh, so here, let's say there is a, so just a, so as I was saying that a list and tuple, they always allow duplicates, but set does not allow any duplicate elements. So here is what we have done, just to show you the demo. There is my list where the content is the similar, Alice 22900.45 then true, my tuple with the same content, my set with the same content. But some for list it is a box bracket, for tuple it is a parenthesis, and for set it is a curly brace. And uh, then what I have done now, list actually has a function called append. If you just put like my list and dot, then Google uh, Colab will give you several suggestions that what you can do, what type of functions are available for set. So let me just show you if I just put dot in here, as you can see, there is a suggestion for a lot of different functions. Now I have used the function called append over here. And uh, then inside append, what I have done, I have intentionally added a duplicated element. All right. Now you can add the duplicated element during the set initial uh, list initial initialization also, not a problem. I just wanted to show that, well, there are several functions that you can also use. That's why I have done it. So here, basically, intentionally, I have added a duplicated element to my list. And it's all okay. If I just print it, you will see that my list have been printed like this. So if you just run it up until after printing this point, everything is okay. Now, if I just uh, do this, if I want to append Alice in the tuple, then you will get an error because once again, tuple cannot change and tuple does not have any attribute or any function like append in it because changing the tuple is not allowed. So I'm commenting out this line. Now look at this set, what is happening here? So in set, there is nothing called append, but it has a function called add using which you can add some extra member. Here again, by adding this, uh, I tried to add the similar duplicated element to my set like this. So now let's see what happened here. 
for this set, well, it did not throw any error uh, while adding the duplicated element. But as you can see in here, that duplication have been automatically eliminated by Python and Alice is printed just once. All right. And now if you are not very sure that whether set is working properly or not, so let's change it to Bob just to check whether it can uh, add another element or not. If you just run it, you'll see that, well, Bob is uh, added properly, but if you just make it a duplicated element that is already present like this, it is not adding it anymore. So that's the difference between list, set, and tuple. Any question? So let's get, uh, let's take like uh, 10, 15 seconds to familiarize yourself and just uh, think about what you have learned because now we are going for dictionary, which is a little bit more complicated compared to these things. All right, any question or confusion? All right, so let's move to the next data structure, which is a dictionary. So dictionary is basically, you can think of a, think it of as a list just to visualize, but that list has user defined index. Instead of just numerical zero, one, two, three index, list has its user defined index, means you can define the index also. So it is basically user defined index means what it is called key. So in a list, in a dictionary, user defined index is uh, and the value stored as a key value pair always. And uh, all the keys are unique, duplicate elements are eliminated automatically. Uh, so the other way of viewing the dictionary as an extended version of the set where keys are basically each element of the set. So you can think it of as a hybrid of list and set, something like that to add some extra facilities. So here is how you can start a dictionary. Uh, I mean, uh, initialize a dictionary. So here is a dictionary called my dict, then equals dictionary is also like set. Dictionary is also enclosed within opening and closing curly brace. And then what I have done, I just put a name to all the data that you have used before. So the first was name is Alice, then the age is 22 and salary is 900.45 and then is student true. Now here you will see that each element has two different parts. The first one, this name, age, salary and is student, those things are called key. Those needs to be unique. And here name is Alice, age is 22, salary is 900.45, and then is student is uh, two. And the value is basically here separated with a colon. So the left side is a key, name, age, salary, and is student, then a colon, and then there is the value, what we have used for all other data structures. And every element just like before are separated with comma. All right, and now since a key are not, keys are nothing but a user defined index, you can always access each of the value, value stored inside the, in each of these user defined index using the similar fashion that you have used for list. In list, you have used just one, two, three, four, or something like that, those numbers to access the elements. But here you can use those user defined keys. So if you want to print the name, it will be name, then age, then salary, then is student. If you just run it, you'll see that everything has been printed properly. Any question? So dictionary is just like a dictionary in each, in a dictionary, in an English dictionary, you will see that each element, each word is appearing exactly once, right? Uh, and then for each word, there are some value means the meaning. 
And this is the generalized version of our dictionary where instead of meaning, you are storing some other things also. So if you are from the programming background, you can think it of as a hash table, uh, which is almost, uh, uh, which you can get in uh, C++ or Java. And this is Python way of uh, hash table. So Dana asked, can single and double co? Yes, it can. You can do that in Python. That's a good question. And yes, in Python, you can use either single quote or double quote. They are all same. Everything is same uh, string. Uh, but in other programming language like C or Java, single quotation means it always need to be a single character. And double quotation means a full text. But Python does not have those separation. Uh, it's all same. And here I always uh, follow kind of a restriction, my self-imposed restriction. I always use single quote for the key. And uh, if the value is also string, I always use a double quote, but uh, that's just to make it di di different. But uh, you are free to do that, whatever it feels good to you. So, that's about the dictionary. So any question regarding any of these areas. So these are basically fundamental uh, data structure which can hold multiple data items together under the same name in Python. Based on these things, a lot of different libraries have been proposed like NumPy, like Pandas. That's what we are going to learn today. Again, next. So before going to this NumPy and Pandas, any question? Uh, I think in the chat window, I have a question. Could you please increase the text size? Uh, is it okay now? Thanks. Sure. Uh, oops. All right. So, all right. Uh, so, this is this these are the basic data types so now the question is why should we go for this type of numpy or pandas since uh, python seems to be pretty easy and list is pretty generalized you can store lots of different things but the major thing is this e these libraries are basically a product of significantly many man hours than you will spend for your project. There are lots of experts, they, are, they have built these libraries with uh, very efficient code. And so these libraries are significantly faster compared to your homegrown code. So always try to use these libraries if you want to get efficiency in your program. So basically these NumPy and Pandas give you capability to faster array handling. Also, it is very much memory efficient compared to the normal code. Uh, and of course, the major benefit as a data scientist from an other background, you need to write a very less lines of code. And the last but not the least, these are user friendly because of four, these four different reasons, these things are significantly popular among the data science community. Now these NumPy and Pandas, if you go to the back end, these libraries are built with either C++, mostly C++ language because C++ is a very high performance language. But if uh, as a data scientist, if you want to start focusing on all those uh, programming nitty gritty details, uh, you will lose the broader picture. So as a data scientist, I always recommend focus on how to utilize these libraries, not how to write distributed code or parallel code or faster code, something like that. Let the library take care of it. Okay, so that's why you have to use NumPy and Pandas. So let me go to the next part which is introduction to NumPy. Now, in order to use these NumPy and Pandas, all these libraries, first you have to install it in your machine. In a normal Linux machine, there is a tool called pip in pip, uh, which uh, Python pip install packages, it's a recursive type of name. So, uh, so in computer science, we use this recursive type of name very frequently, it means GNU, GNU is not Unix. So lots of different recursive names are there. So PEEP stands for PEEP 
install packages. And pip can be executed in Linux terminal uh, just like this. If you are working on a Linux machine, you can just write pip install numpy. Numpy is the name of the package that we are going to use, package or library or module, whatever you want, you can say. And in Google Colab, you have to use a exclamation symbol uh, in the uh, before executing any Linux command. This is how the Google Colab distinguish between it is a Linux command or it is a Python code. Okay, so if you have an exclamation sign, you it will execute in the cloud server as a Linux command, but not as a Python code. So if I just run it. Now, Google, the beauty of Google Colab is uh, you really do not need to install all these libraries. I have showed it uh, just to show you that, well, these things can be done. If you want to use your own package, you can install it in this way. But uh, all the popular Python package like NumPy, like Pandas, uh, TensorFlow, or PyTorch, all these things are already installed in your environment. So you really do not need to install it. And uh, if you try to install it, you will see that well requirement is already satisfied. And uh, then after installation, now it's the time to import the NumPy in your program. So in order to do that, uh, so this should be NumPy. And so what you have to do, you have to use a keyword called import and then import numpy you can leave it in here but in python the good practice is we always import the entire module like numpy or pandas inside a variable name inside a small easy to use name and the most popular way popular variable name to import numpy is np i mean it's kind of universal everyone use this NP name. You can use any name of your choice, but I will stick to this uh, convention. So import NumPy as NP means all the functionalities of NumPy will be imported inside this NP variable name. And if you want to check the type of this NP, so let's run it. You'll see that, well, NP is basically a type module. All right, so this entire NumPy module is imported inside np variable so any question regarding installation and importing numpy in your environment so yeah and one thing you have to remember if you get logged out sometime from your google collab every time you will open this session you have to uh ever run this uh, import every time you will disconnect it and then if you reconnect again because it will lose everything so as i have discussed the numpy the reason behind numpy using is uh, faster it has a massive library support means less line of code and it is also memory efficient so now let us uh, see how uh, efficient it is so let me just uh, zoom out a little bit so that you can see the entire code in one screen so what i have done first i have taken a vector of size one so vector is basically an array type data structure what i have discussed uh, it's kind of a list you can think of now inside this vector what i have done i have put all the elements starting from one to the size of the vector so there is only one element so x has one then y also has one all right so these are just kind of an array if you are interested you can just type uh, print x and print y to check the content of x and y i'm not going into there but because but it is taking all the elements from zero to uh, that size of the vector anyway so then what i have done my intention is to add each element by add these two vectors element by element so what i have done i have used a loop called for then index in range zero to length x and one i am pretty sure that you can remember the for loop syntax from the last lecture and then what i have done we have done just z equals xi and yi oh sorry it should be See, i equals xi and yi. 
All right. So what it will do? X zero plus y zero will be stored into z zero. X one plus y one stored into z one. X two y two. Uh, the addition result will be stored in uh, z three. Uh, z two. Something like this. So element by element addition. And then what I have done, I just wanted to check the time. So Python has a function called time. Uh, I mean, uh, it has a module called time. If you want to check the time, you have to import that module also in the beginning of the code, as you can see in here. And uh, in the beginning, I have taken the timestamp before doing all this code. And I am taking the same timestamp once again in uh, here. And what I am doing here is, the finishing timestamp minus the initial timestamp that I have stored in T1. So it will give me how much time it has spent for uh, doing this calculation just by using a normal array, normal list. All right, so here what it is doing, then I'm just printing time taken by a regular loop and I'm just printing this uh, variable name. And here, the next part of the code, everything is same, but here I have used, there is a function called np.a range and then size of vector, which basically creates a numpy object, the same list, but using numpy efficiencies. All right, in, the, the, in this way, it will create all the objects. And then I have stored in X, the same way I have created Y, and then here, there is a syntactical difference that we will come later. We just wrote z equals x plus y. You really do not need to write any type of loop or anything or indexing mechanism or anything because NumPy automatically in the back end take care of all these things very efficiently, possibly by utilizing a parallel calculation. Maybe uh, first two, uh, it will add two, uh, digits, I mean, sorry, two numbers at a time, then again, merge those results and all these things uh, in parallel. And so lots of different way it is taking care of parallelism, how it can do the summation. So those things are taken care of. So here, basically, this time taken is giving you the result for the time taken by this NumPy based calculation. And finally, what we have done is I just did a the division time taken by the regular loop divided by time taken by NumPy. And then I am saying that, well, NumPy is this much time faster. So now if I just run this code, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So, oh, all right. So here it should be just Z and like this. Okay. So here, as you see, here it is just one vector. That's why NumPy is possibly an overkilling. That is why NumPy is only 0 0.04 times fast, 0 0.03 times faster. All right. But let's see what happened if I do it 10. So the same operation. Now in NumPy is still in this example, it is 0.5 times faster, which is less. Let's make it 100. Let, sorry. Let's see what happened. Now see, once you are handling more and more data, NumPy started showing its performance benefit because NumPy has significant parallel overhead, which is not, which is kind of overkilling for small amount of data. But whenever you will get more amount of data, you will see that more and more performance gain. And with 100 data points, you got two times faster. If you change it to 1000, let's run it. Sorry. Uh, so for 1000 also, it is two times faster. If you just make it 10,000, you will see that, all right, it is. 27 times more faster for 10,000 data points. And if you just increase the data more, like let's say like this, and you will see that, well, 24 times and increase it more. Sometimes you can get like 37 times. And if your data size is more like 1 million or 1 billion, you will get like 
almost 100 times performance benefit with all these things. Now for the similar small addition operation, NumPy is offering that much performance gain. Now think of a complicated operation uh, if you try to write your own code and if you try to use NumPy function. Now you can understand why you should use all these uh, libraries. So any question? So this piece of code is basically to justify why you want to use NumPy by using some illustration. And uh, is anyone trying to write this code or are you all done? Okay, so anyway, so this is, uh, uh, this is not the part of data science, but to justify what is the uh, advantage of utilizing these libraries. Now let us focus on how to use these NumPy arrays, which is possibly the focus of this uh, workshop, uh, how to use it. So first of all, what we will do, we should create a NumPy arrays. Now, these NumPy arrays are basically a type of list but in NumPy, it only allows either integer or floating point number, nothing else. You cannot type, write like you cannot have any type of string or any type of uh, things inside this uh, NumPy array. It should be either integer or it should be a floating point number. Why? Because that way you can uh, tell the Python program that well, make it memory efficient by blocking only 32 bits of things because string can be any length but integer needs to be of 32 bits or 64 bits something something like that this way you can tell the python program uh, you can make your python program a little bit memory efficient and also uh, it will be significantly more faster now there yeah, and now if i just run it you will see that well uh, a is an n numpy array and if you want to create a numpy array you have to use this function np why np because we have imported the entire module numpy as np right so that's why we have used np and then dot then there is a function called array if you want to see all the suggestions just put dot and wait for a few seconds and it will show you what are available over here there is a function called array where which i have used and inside this array, first I have written all these uh, data points, uh, what I want to store like 0, 1, 2. And then here I have told that what type of data, I, what type of integer I want to use. Now, in order to make the data NumPy array more space efficient, uh, I have used this D type in 32 by specifically saying that I want to use a 32 bit integer. But to support larger integer, NumPy basically support until 64 bit, like each integer will take 64 bit place in memory. So if you just do like this, it will not throw any type of error. But what you will see is the type have been changed from in 32 to in 64. So with small amount of data, you will not realize any type of performance uh, problem or any type of memory issues. But when you are handling like 1 million data points, just think of how much extra memory it will use. For every integer, it is utilizing almost double. All right. So like that. So it is a uh, uh, skipped writing this one yeah so so you must uh, so you skip this in t in 64 uh, in 32 or something so what you will end up in all the elements will take 64 bit 64 bit and 64 bit over here so 64 times 3 but if you just do like this d type in 32 specifically saying everything will take 32 bits so 32 times 3 it is only 96 bits instead of uh, double like 192 bits. So any question? So this is how NumPy offers memory efficiency. And I have already illustrated uh, how NumPy offers uh, 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 faster programming also. So uh, 
Now you can add a dot zero for each of these numbers to read the data as a floating point numbers. You do not need to do that, but just to tell you that what you can do. Now here, what I have done, just uh, Q accumulate, I mean, just did uh, two examples at the same time. Uh, here, along with floating point numbers, what I have done, I am showing you two dimensional array. So array can take any dimension. It can be one dimensional, it can be one dimensional array, or it can, one dimensional array or vector in linear algebra terminology, or it can be a two dimensional array or a matrix in linear algebra terminology, or it can be three or more, uh, like a array, three or more dimensional array, which is uh, generally called tensor. So anything is possible. So here, basically I have used two dimensional array, uh, which is basically, utilizing this box bracket a little cleverly. So the first box bracket is saying that, well, it is uh, enclosing the entire array and then inside each of these box black box bracket, there is the first row and then there is a second row of the matrix. So if you are called, if you know what is a matrix, then you will find that it is uh, comfortable. By the way, so all of you are familiar with the concept of matrix, by the way in this uh, workshop or is there anyone who does not know the concept of matrix all right so anyway if you are not familiar with the concept of matrix then just think of it for this lecture just a two dimensional array or you can think of it as an array of array all right so like this and here I have specifically mentioned that the data type of this entire array will be float 32. Otherwise, by default, it will use 64 bit float 64 or something like that. And if you want to access one element of this two dimensional array, you have to use two different index. The first one is a row. So the first one is basically the row, and the second one is basically the column. All right, so here basically it is saying that zeroth row and one th column, which one is the element. So it is basically zeroth row means this one and one th column means this one. So nine, eight. So that's what it is saying. So it is printing eight here and the type is basically printing. This, this will be same for all the elements. So if you do one, one or zero, one, it does not matter. It will always print float 32 over here any question did you all understand how to access an element in a two-dimensional array so one-dimensional array accessing an element is exactly like python list what we have discussed just one index inside a box bracket but two-dimensional array means you have to use row comma column there is another way but we will avoid it uh, for confusion but anyway so just focus on this syntax any question? All right, so now if you are done with this array, then let's get some information of uh, information about this NumPy array. So uh, if you want to copy paste uh, previous code, uh, I mean, uh, so just, uh, so here, what I have done, I just uh, copy pasted the previous code and just put some extra value so if you want to do that you can just copy paste this code because with this uh, b variable i am going to uh, show all these illustrations so basically this is just creating the same numpy array with another variable name that's it so like that and next let's say uh next let's say if i want to get the type of this entire array. What I can do is, so you can get the type in two different ways. One is basically type and then each of the elements type, something like that. Or you can use this B dot B type. That will also give you the type of this element, but written in a different fashion, but they basically indicates to the same data type. But uh, here, one thing you should notice in this B array 
this b array is basically a mix of floating point number like this 9.9 .9 and lots of integer 8 7 6 5 4 here i did not specify any data type here so what will happen is it will just uh, take like uh, assign the data type that are that can accommodate the most space hungry element so floating point number is basically the most space hungry compared to integer and floating point. So all the data item will be treated as a floating point number and not integer. So that's what you have to remember always when working with this. Now let's say, so this is about how to get the type of all the elements. Next is uh, get the dimension of an array, which is B dot N dim. That will give you the dimension of the array. Means it is a two dimensional array. If there are three dimensional, you can do that. So like so. And then let's say, if you want to get the shape of the array, well, this is giving you the exact di actual dimension, but this is giving you how many, uh, how many rows and how many columns are exactly there so this b has like two rows and three columns so it printed two cross three two two comma three this is rows and columns and also if you want to get the number of elements total number of elements in this uh, array you can cop do like b dot size and it will print uh, six elements so three times two that is six elements it is print it printed and also you can get like uh, how much uh, bytes it is taking uh, just to check how much space hungry your program is. Uh, it will take like uh, four bytes. Uh, it means uh, since it is uh, in 32 or uh, float 32, uh, it will, uh, so here, well, so here basically I did not specify any type of data item, right? So here, if I just run it, you will see that it is float 64 type of data and like so and b dot size is six and since it is a float 64 by default it is taking eight byte means 64 divided by eight so 64 is the bit and bit to byte is uh, you have to divide it by eight so like that and if you want to get the total size if you just run it you will see that eight times six elements are there so it is taking total 48 bytes in memory so this is how you can get the size of the array and these are some information about numpy element so any question so all right if you do not have any question now let's uh, go a little bit more deeper how to access and changing some specific cell row or columns it's almost same as your uh, list uh, list handling uh, but a little bit of syntax difference so what i am doing here i have created one array called array 1d equals uh, np dot array 1 2 3 4 i just stored and printed the array over here like 1 2 3 4 and we will just uh, keep on working with uh, this array. So here, if I want to get a, so let me run this. So it is one, two, three, four. Now, if I want to get a specific element in an 1D array, I just need to use this index. So as is, since it starts from zero, it will print three over here. You can try with uh, any other index number and it will print uh, whatever. Uh, value you want. So if you just do like zero, it will print one. And in this way, it will do. And uh, so uh, this is basically not 1D, this is a 2D example. So 2D example, what I have done is I just wrote like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 in the next row. And then if I just print 2D array, it will be like this. And as I have shown you earlier, if you want to do a specific element, you can always type this array 2D followed by one comma, I mean the row number comma, the column number to get a specific element. So just before running this uh, array, just think of what should be the output of this one and five, and then you can run it. 
So one means zero and one eighth row means this and uh, five column number five means zero, one, two, three, four, five. So it should print 13 over here. You can use this syntax also like uh, box bracket in one box bracket, uh, the row number, and then in another box bracket to the column number, but uh, that can raise a confusion for NumPy array in future. So uh, just avoid using this uh, syntax. Always stick yourself to this one comma. I mean, this row comma column syntax. All right, any question? And then let's say if we in NumPy, basically it supports getting the last element also, you really do not need to know the uh, actual index number or anything of the last element. But if you just use this minus one and minus one, you can always access this uh, last element. So minus one, the first one is the last element of the row. Uh, I mean, last row and minus one here is the last element, last column. So like so. And if you just go down, I mean, you can type like minus two or something, it will print 13. So the last but one, if you go to four, it will do like 11. So it will just move from last to the first using this minus. So get yourself a little bit uh, familiar with all these things and uh, any question. All right, so if uh, there is no question, then there is another syntax that I would like to say that if you want to get a specific row of a 2D array, you can always this uh, colon. This colon basically means print all the columns in this zeroth row. So it will print you everything like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which is the content of the first column of our array, uh, first row of our array, sorry. So like this, and if you just change it to one, it should print eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, 14, all these things. And the similar way, if you want to get the content of a specific column, then you can use this, uh, uh, this colon for the row number. So all the rows, in this specific column three. So if you just run it, it will print four, one, one, four and 11, because if you go to the original array over here, so it is zero, one, two, three. So four and here zero, one, two, three, four and 11 have been printed. Make sense? Any question? So, and here basically this is the source of confusion. If you just uh, get yourself uh, comfortable with uh, this syntax, uh, this may give you some wrong output. And like in here, so six, five, four, something like that. And it has some meaning, but we are not going into the detail of that. So just to avoid any type of confusion, always stick to this comma separated row and column. So, and I'm not going into the detail of this, getting a little more fancy. You can do a lot of things. Uh, I will share this IPy NB and you can think of like, uh, do some brain exercise, what is happening. And uh, well, so just uh, here, basically, just to give you the idea, if you want to change a particular element, what you can do is one, five, and then 20. So previously the element here was like 13. Uh, like this. So if I just print, let's say, if I add a print statement over here, print array 2D. So this will give you the first, uh, I mean, how the previous state of the array, and then I am changing it to 20. And then let's see what will happen. So and let me just remove this line and so uh, uh, so here it is like print array 2D, then array 2D 1, 5, I have changed from 13 to 20 and that's why it is printing 
this new array. So it is exactly same as your list, but here two different index, one for row and another for column. And also there is a 3D example. We are not going into the 3D example because it may get a little bit confusing, but well, you can go until any dimension of array as you want. If you want to get yourself familiarized, I will share this iPy notebook uh, with you and you can just get a look and you will see that it's nothing but uh, just going one step deeper to do this uh, 3D array. So here like that, but I'm not going to that today. Uh, possibly that will be the content for next time when we will actually discuss about the tensors and all these different things. Uh, but well, once again, uh, 3D is just a 3D array. Uh, this is just a one more index. So if you want to get a specific element, just use row, column, and let's say height or something like that, or width or something like that. So, and uh, replacing the array elements and all these things are pretty much uh, similar. Uh, you can always use these colon symbols to replace the entire row or entire column, but those things I am not going uh, today. And, uh, but I will share definitely with you with this Python notebook. So anyway, and, uh, but what I want to show you today is like uh, easy way to initializing different types of arrays. Sometimes in your project, you may need to initialize an entire array with all zeros. So NumPy basically offers a function called zeros, all right? And then you can basically use the dimension of the array where you will get this specific dimensional array full of zero. So since we are not going to three dimensional, let me just change it to a two dimensional two cross three matrix. And let's see what happened. As you can see here, I got a zero field matrix where, which is two rows and three columns. Make sense? Any question? Similarly, you have a function called np dot once and well, uh, while specifying it, you can always uh, type the data type. Uh, it is possible to use integer eight, which is making your program like uh, eight times uh, more memory efficient if you do not use anything over here. Because here, if I just uh, do a type of each of these element, you will get that, you will see uh, it is basically getting uh, float 64, let's say the type over here and, oh, sorry. And here it is float 64. So it is taking 64 bits to store and store just a zero, which is a wastage of space. So it is always a good practice to write down this int eight or int uh, something like that based on the, based on your data. So any question? And also not only that, you can always use this np.full uh, where you can uh, this di specify the dimension and followed by some specific number if you want to fill it up. Uh, I have filled uh, 99 for a two cross two matrix and you can do something like that. And uh, like this way, you can do a lot of different uh, things. And these are basically initializing different types of arrays. There are many other ways to initialize arrays, but we are restricting ourselves uh, to only to this uh, for this uh, workshop. So any questions so far? All right, so the other thing is like, well, NP has a random function. Sometime you may need to use a random decimal. You have to uh, fill it, fill up an entire array with randomization function, random uh, numbers or something. You can always use np.random.rand, then the dimension of the matrix and you will get a two cross two matrix or the specific dimensional matrix filled up with all these random numbers. And if you want to make it a random integer value, uh, of course, uh, that is also possible. Just instead of rand, you have to use rand int. 
and you have to you can specify basically if you are uh, filling up with a random integer you can give a lower bound and upper bound uh, in between which all the numbers random numbers will be generated for example here i am saying all the random numbers that will fill a three cross three matrix uh, will be between two and five inclusive so if i just want to make it like zero and one something like this you'll see that all the elements randomly initialized to zero next uh, like this if i do like minus one to one it will change some minus one some one something like that all right so also you can create an identity matrix of any dimension an identity matrix means it's a square matrix where all the diagonal elements are one that's what you can create so here it is a five cross five identity matrix created just by writing np dot identity and then showing the dimension so it is also possible to repeat uh, some array and all these things but i am not going to those uh, things because uh, there is nothing much to learn over here and it's uh, not uh, required for it's not very popular function for many of the data analysis uh, but one thing i would like to say uh, when you will copy some array which is required for many programming purposes if you just do something like this let's say if you just uh, you may think that copying uh, copying an array is exactly similar like a copying a variable but what happened if let's say if i do something like this array equals i have initialized to one two three and then i am doing an array copy and then equals array but it is wrong basically it is making a separate copy of the it is not making a separate copy of the array but point to the same array with a different name how can we understand that you can say like print array copy after changing it i change the first element to 100 and now if i print that array the original array you will see that both the array have been changed so it's not a proper copy of the element proper copy of the array it's the same array it is changing so if you want to make a proper copy you can do a array dot copy which will basically make a separate copy of the function separate copy of the array and now everything is good if you make any change in the array copy over here it will not reflect in array So any question? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. So if we hadn't done air copy equals air first, we just have air, could we go air underscore copy equals air dot copy parentheses air? Uh, like in here or? Yeah. What are you, in here, what, what do you mm -hmm. want to say? Oh, just if you had air and then you wanted to make a copy, um, mm -hmm. you would just skip that second line of code and put air where you have your cursor right now. Yeah. Okay. So like this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's a different syntax. Uh, uh, are you trying to talk about talk about different syntax? I'm not sure. Just maybe yeah. a faster way to do it. Okay, sure. I mean, yeah, you can uh, do that way also. I mean, uh, there are lots of different ways, different syntaxes are possible. Yeah, so thanks for sharing that uh, syntax. Yes, of course, you can do that way also. That's a faster way to do that. Okay. But, but well, sometimes uh, since I'm from a computer science background, I normally want to take the advantage of like this uh, dot operator, which is basically an object oriented program. And we we use this type of syntax, but well, mm -hmm. thank you for so adding. You don't need that second line of code, really. That's that's not doing it. This one. The, uh, so sending array copy to array is is not necessary before you if you're going to copy it. And that's the... like right, you here. just had that to illustrate. Yeah. And here, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Of course, we do not need that. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So yeah, and uh, 
like this way and next is let's do a little bit of mathematical analysis for which numpy is uh, most useful and here again just to avoid some crawling uh, scrolling up and down i have created one array over here and then i just created an np dot array and print that array so let me run this program and now i'm going to use it now numpy whenever you will use the plus symbol minus symbol or any arithmetic operator it will automatically use it for this entire array so like this way so if i do this like let's say array plus two uh, it will basically add one plus two that is three two plus two four three plus two five like this array minus two means it will do the same operation one minus uh, two is minus one, two minus two is zero, something like that. And the similar way it is doing like uh, multiplication and division. And as you know from the last uh, workshop, star star means it is basically uh, raised to the power. So it is basically one raised to the power two is one, two raised to the power two is four, three raised to the power two is nine, four raised to the power two is 16, something like that. And well, the best part is if you want to add like two different arrays like this in here, np.array, uh, it is one, two, three, four, and the other array is one, zero, one, zero. And if you want to add each element by element, uh, you just do not need to use any loop or anything. You just use this uh, plus symbol. This is not only a line i mean uh, less line of code but if you use a for loop you will lose the performance because whenever you will use for loop you are doing it a sequentially but if you take the advantage of numpy's plus symbol in the context of two different numpy arrays it will automatically uh, make use of some inbuilt parallelism and will do all these different things for you so it will be faster uh, like the example that i have shown in the beginning and also it has several other mathematical functions like sine and cosine. If you're interested, you can go over that. And also you can do several linear algebra. Linear algebra is not today's focus. So there is a documentation. I will share this uh, notebook and you can go over there and you will see that NumPy, you can use NumPy to uh, like uh, make the determinant uh, trace or singular vector de de decomposition, eigenvalues, uh, inverse of the, matrix, everything you can do utilizing a NumPy array. And there are functions like this. Let's say if you want to get the identity matrix, uh, np.identity, if you want to get the determinant of a matrix, you can just use this uh, linear algebra dot determinant and then the matrix. Uh, this is one because determinant of an identity matrix is just one. I'm not going into the, those details. But let us see a little bit of uh, these uh, statistical analysis. Uh, so here I have created an array called uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, a two-dimensional array. And here basically just to show you like some basic statistics, like if you want to calculate the mean, just use np.mean and then pass the name of the array. And that's it, that will find you the minimum element. If you want to find the maximum element, uh, you can, well, maximum element, you can always do like this. It will just uh, in, uh, do the entire max over the entire array. So six is the maximum element. So it printed six, but sometimes you may be interested in finding the column wise maximum. So what you can do, this is, oh, sorry. So what you can do is basically, you can do axis equals one. Sometimes in data analysis, it is very important to find the maximum at each column. What is there? So each column is giving you the value and you want to find the maximum at each column. So if you just do that, you will see that in the axis uh, one, I mean, sorry, uh, it's a row wise I am doing. So it is the axis, uh, the row, uh, first row, it is uh, three and second row maximum is basically six. And if you just do it like, axis zero or something, you will see that column wise. So one, four is four, two, five, maximum is five, three, six, maximum is six. So axis zero is column wise maximum and axis one is a row wise maximum, something like that. 
And also if you want to do a column wise summation and all these things, NP has a sum. And again, if you want to do column wise, then you can put an axis equals zero and it will add all these things. So one plus four equals five, two plus five, seven, three plus six equals nine. And that's what it printed. And if you want to do uh, all the elements sum, you can just get rid of this axis and it will print one, two, three, four, five, six, the entire sum of the array. And like so, and so this way you can handle each row wise or column wise, something like that. So this column wise thing is very much important for uh, data science because we mostly focus on each column. So that's why this thing is important. All right, any question? And uh, the reorganizing the array, I'm not going to cover it uh, today, but the other thing that I will show is querying an array, all right? So querying an array is very important from a data science perspective, where basically you can query the array based on some Boolean condition. And we will propagate this concept to pandas also uh, to show some illustration. So let's say here there is a file data, which basically I have created a two dimensional array where like there are lots of numbers as you can see in here. And you can just uh, type all these numbers. So let me just uh, copy paste this thing in uh, the Zoom chat window so that you can just copy paste this uh, in the chat window I have copied and uh, you can simply copy paste these numbers. But, uh, and what I have done is uh, I just uh, created, and here is another way you can specify the type also. And also it is okay if you just do the D type over here also, but I'm not going into the detail of type, but I just printed the file data just to show you that well, this file data is storing all these arrays. So like so. And now what you can do is basically you, let's say you want to check all the file data that are greater than 50. So what you can do just file data, then inside this opening and closing box bracket, just write your condition inside a parenthesis. All right, so here basically you are saying that no, write down all the file data or get all the file data that value is greater than 50 and store it in result. And so here like this, so let me just run it. And as you can see, all the members, all the values that have a value greater than 50 are being stored in result. And not only that, you can have conjugated, uh, I mean, uh, like with the relational operator also you can use, it can be something like that. Here, what I am saying, uh, well, uh, all the data members which are greater than 50, but less than 90, print out only those data or store those data only. So if I just run it, you will see that, well, it is printing something like this. All right, so here it is uh, basically the way. Uh, so what it basically does is it basically goes uh, check each of the element over here, whatever condition you have specified. And then basically NumPy write uh, true or false based on this condition. So the first element is one. So file data one is greater than 50. No, it is false. So it will be false. The next one is also false. This is also false. This is also false. The next one is true. So it will write down true. And after that, after assigning this true and false value for each of these elements, then it is basically printing or basically getting the all the elements that have true in that position. Make sense? So that's how NumPy actually works. But uh, for a data scientist, you just need to know the syntax. Uh, this is how you can easily filter out the data. And uh, 
not only that uh, to checking uh, each cell of a specific row also you can check something like this uh, this one is basically doing everything in the entire numpy matrix or the numpy two dimensional array but if you want to do it for each row what you have to do you have to just specify the row number like let's say row 0 and then result equals file data then which row you want to conduct your search and then file data row greater than 50 so everywhere you have to specify the row so this is possible kind of like there are many other way to do that but this is possibly the simplest way to visualize uh, this one to do that uh, there is a row and uh, everywhere whenever you are doing something just make use of this row variable over here so this is basically taking one row and then file data row again assigning all this true or false in that row zero and it is getting all the result so and it will do like only in the first row it is 190 196 and 75 and uh, like in here 196 and 75 they are greater than 70 are uh, greater than 50 otherwise all less than 50 and also you can do the same thing for conjugated condition also so it's only 75 if you do like greater than 50 but less than 90 so that is uh, all for a beginner level introduction for numpy and now any question are you all feeling comfortable with numpy or it seems like too much for one lecture is it okay perfect so now let's say we can take a four minutes break. We are at 11.26 and then the next 20 minutes we will take to learn pandas. Again, we will cover only the basics of pandas, which we can build on top of this NumPy. But before going there, we will take a break and then we will go around the room also once. So let's meet around 11.30.
All right, so it's uh, 11.30, so let's uh, go around the room. So let's, uh, so let's see who we got new. Uh, I think most of uh, the students I got, uh, most of the participants we got in the earlier, but anyway, we got a couple of uh, extra uh, participants. So let's start with Ibrahim Gorbani. And next, uh, Gregory Short, our ASF member. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm here. I'm not sure what we're doing at the moment. So, okay, so we are just going around the room. You can just introduce and say hi and do uh, oh, okay. organization. So that's- I wasn't all. getting audio from elsewhere. Um, yeah, my, hi, my name is Greg Short. I'm a senior software engineer at the Alaska Satellite Facility. And I think in a little bit here, I'll be doing a little talk on some of these topics as they pertain to ASF. Great. Uh, next is uh, Randy Fulweber. Good morning. My name is Randy Fulweber, and I am Tulix GIS and Remote Sensing Manager. Thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, Megan McPhee. Hello. Yeah, I'm Megan McPhee. I'm an associate professor in fisheries located in Juneau, and I work on the ecology and evolution of Pacific salmon. And I'm new to Python. I use R a lot, but not Python so much. Great. So how are you enjoying it? Is it okay? It's okay. It's a little fast, <laughs> but I'll, you know, I'm keeping up barely. <laughs> okay. Sure. Uh, thank you. And Dana Brown. Hi, sorry, I was trying to get my video on. I'm Dana Brown. I'm research faculty here uh, at IARC, and uh, most of my work is dealing with geospatial analysis. I've mainly been using JavaScript for um, doing analysis in Google Earth Engine, and I'm just trying to get my feet under me in Python now. Oh, thanks. Uh, Amanda Stormaki. Stormaki, sorry. Yeah, hi. Um... I'm Amanda Stromecki. I'm in the Institute of Arctic Biology. I'm a research technician um, in a microbiology lab and find myself using a lot of data science kind of tools without a lot of background or knowledge on how they work. So just trying to familiarize myself with Python and it's been good so far, although I missed the first session. So um, yeah. Sure. Uh, next is Cody Howell. Hi, I'm Cody. I'm a first year PhD student and I work with microbial data sets. So that's my general interest in, in Python and still very new, but uh, enjoying, enjoying the session so far. So thank you so much for holding them. Thank you. And next is Heike Markle. Hi, um, somehow I can't get my video started. My name is Heike, I work for the Alaska Center for Energy and Power as a project manager, and we work with marine energy data and use Python notebooks to organize our data sets. Great, and the last one, Dane Harmon. Hey, uh, I'm a graduate, uh, I mean, I'm a graduate of the UAFCS program, and uh, I heard about an interesting talk on a topic I hadn't uh, involved myself much in, so I figured I'd uh, check it out and learn something. Sure, thank you. And we got one participant in person, so if you go ahead and intro introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm Kale Chronic. I'm a sophomore computer science student, and uh, that's pretty much it. I'm just here for... Uh, Supplemental my CS103 class. Sure. Thank you. So, all right. And uh, thank you all for showing up uh, once again and attending this uh, session. So, let's move to the next part of the session where I will introduce the pandas concept in very short, uh, uh, whatever we can cover uh, in this time and in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. And uh, then let's see. 
So, uh, well, uh, let me share my screen once again. And so what do you need to do is uh, you can always stick to the same Google Colab uh, where you started working. Uh, what you need to do now, uh, if you are not in Google Colab, if you're in something else, somewhere else, uh, you have to install pandas using this peep install pandas. But if you are in Google Colab, it's automatically installed and the requirements is already satisfied the same way as NumPy. And if you want to uh, import uh, pandas, you can just uh, use this import pandas as PD and the same way. And PD is the most popular name to import pandas module uh, in Python program. So now in NumPy, whatever we have seen, those were basically all array, different types of arrays. We call it in the array or in dimensional arrays. It can be one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional. In pandas, basically everything we work with data frame and series. Those are the pandas fundamental data structure. So let us try to create a uh, pandas uh, series and data frame and let's uh, start working with that. So in the easiest way to understand about data frame and series is uh, like, let's say I am creating a data, I mean a dictionary where each of the key has a separate name like ID and name, then separated by colon and the value is basically an array or let's say a list. So key is a string where value is instead of a single number or single variable, uh, or single value, it is basically an array, all right? So that's the only difference. So here ID is one, two, three, four, five, and the names are just like one corresponding to Alice, then Bob, then Cindy, David, Elizabeth, something like that. And if you just uh, try to check the type of the data, then you will see that it is a dictionary. So like so. And uh, this is how you can create a dictionary. Now from this dictionary, we can, it is the easiest way to view pandas uh, data structure. What is a data frame and what is a uh, series? So uh, data frame, uh, it is DF is basically uh, the name we normally use for data frame. So here basically what I have done is it is a PD dot data frame. And then I just stored this entire dictionary. So this entire dictionary has different two different rows and uh, each row has like five different columns, right? So that's what we have done. And now let me just uh, run this piece of code and you will see that, well, by using this pd dot data frame function and then using this uh, data inside we have created a pandas data frame from the dictionary all right so if again if you just hit dot and you will see that pd offers a lot of different functions and you have to use this data frame function to create a data frame from the dictionary all right, so now if I just print this type DF, you can see the data. And if you just print this, just print just DF, then what you will see is, so let me get rid of this line and in here. So it is uh, ID and name. So this is how a data frame looks like. And if you want to get the Jupyter notebook kind of visualization, just write, df over here it is a little bit fascinating uh, flashy display uh, which showing you a tabular format a data frame all right so this is how you can create a data frame uh, using this panda data frame function now series means it's just as the name is suggesting it's just one dimensional data frame is two dimensional table kind of things and series is basically one dimensional so what we are doing we are just taking the array corresponding to this name ID. So data ID, just the first row we are taking as a series over here. And now if I just do this, commenting out this part, and this SRS, SRS basically is a type series. All right. And now if you just print this SRS, you will see that, well, 
it is basically a pandas series and this is the series value zero is one one two three four like this and another thing uh, which is important to understand that uh, we learned about series and data frame but uh, well each of the column of our data frame itself like this is basically a series so if i just do that you will see that the column of our data frame is basically nothing but a series one column is a series so this type of concepts we need to use uh, many times in uh, pandas and also it is uh, possible to convert a numpy array to pandas and pandas data frame to numpy array uh, there is nothing much to explain over here just to tell you that well there is the data frame function where you can uh, instead of uh, passing a dictionary like this uh, what you can do you can just pass an entire numpy array and then set the column names like this uh, according to your choice you can always uh, get rid of the columns and that will work fine uh, it will automatically put some name for you but it is always a good practice to give some column name and this is how you can convert a numpy array to pandas data frame and not only that the other way is also possible from numpy to ndr array all right so uh, but well we do not use uh, pandas to do like this type of small small data analysis like dictionary or like that but normally we use panda to read some big data set stored in some csv file and then we do that so what you, what i am going to do now i am going to share a link in the chat window which uh, you can copy paste so what i have done in this link basically i have sorry so in this link basically i have made a csv file available that's a very popular uh, cancer data set which i have made available and that's where we want to work this file is actually stored in here in my csv file and i have uh, shared it sorry is not required it is also done so we are in here so what you have to do just uh, copy paste it as a file url the link that i have shared and you can copy paste it from your google uh, gmail and then you can use this pd.read csv function and then the file url which will basically give you the entire data set inside a data frame named df underscore cancer so if i just uh, run it you will see that the entire csv file have been imported into this df dot cancer data frame make sense did you all get it anyone having any trouble is it working did it work for you all right perfect so this is how you can get the entire data frame inside uh, entire csv file in data frame where each of these things are this is a column and these are basically a row so instead of just an excel you are now inside df cancer a pandas data frame and on this you can do a lot of different things now i just uh, close it uh, because i need to uh, sc scroll a lot so i just wanted to avoid it now there are many other different way to read the file either from your local machine or available uh, in your google drive so i will share this entire spreadsheet entire google collab uh, ipython notebook and you can see the syntax how you can do all these things okay but i am not going into the detail of all these things in this uh, lecture rather let us focus on these exploring some of the data set so well once again to avoid a little bit scrolling i am writing the same thing but you really do not need to type this part because you already typed it the same thing just reading it and then there is a function called dot info which basically give you a lot of information about the data frame so what you can do is if you just type it if you just run it you will see that well all the different information about different columns are there 
And here it is basically it is saying the data types, uh, how many ty different types of data is there. There is some float data, there are some integer data column, there is an object, and then there is a memory usage of 142 kilobytes. Uh, that's a very nice uh, statistics. And here basically uh, the object data set is this M and B. If you just go to this uh, data frame, you will see that, well, there is an aim like that. So this is basically a string object and everything else is either floating point number or integer, something like that. That's what it gave you in here. All right, now here you can see a lot of different things. So let me do something. Uh, so right now in this uh, function, it is uh, just so showing you there is no null content and all these data types and everything like that. And now let me just change this uh, data type. Let's say there is something called radius and let me just get rid of uh, some data here and then some data over here in the radius column and then I got rid of perimeter column one data set you really do not need to do anything but what you can do uh, just to read the data set let's just wait for a few seconds when Google Drive is saving it and now let's read this thing once again uh, just to run where you are reading the thing reading this data so data reading this file and then if you just click on this get info, you will see that, well, it may take some time. And what, uh, for me. So, so, sorry? <laughs> updated on my copy. Oh, it updated on your copy? Mm -hmm. All right, so possibly there is some problem going on in my collab but Dr. Lawler actually got uh, these things. So there should be some non-null uh, on this, uh, this one. So it should be changed basically. And uh, not only that, uh, so let me see. So can you see that in your copy also or not really? So here, now it is updated. So it is taking some time. So as you can see, 568 non-null because uh, there is and in the radius and then 568 in the perimeter, one null value we have introduced it. Okay, okay. so just to do that, let me just control Z and let's take some time to read that. All right, so like this way and Okay, so this is how now if you want to get the information about a series, then you can always use a describe function to do that. Uh, instead of this info, you can just do this uh, describe and you will see that it will give you about uh, a series like ID is there over here. Uh, this column has lots of different statistics about this column, like how many data points are there, what is the mean, what is standard deviation, what is mean, 25 percentile and 50 percentage, and all these different information it will give to you. And if you want to get the number of columns, name of the columns, you can use like dot columns. And uh, if you want to see how many columns are there, sometimes it is required, you can just use this len function and then the data frame name and dot columns, it will, you will get the function, uh, how many columns are there. Also, just like this uh, NumPy, since Pandas is actually taking the advantage of NumPy, it's built on top of NumPy, and it just added some uh, string handling capability on top of NumPy, because NumPy is only for integer and floating point numbers, Pandas support both. But most of the functions are basically similar to NumPy, that is uh, shape. And so you can see that, well, there is 569 rows and 32 columns. And also if you, you can, if you want to see the first n columns, uh, first n rows, you can always use this head function. Here I am just checking like n equals two. And here this is a uh, head is showing that just n. Uh, the first two rows is visible. And not only that, if you want to see the last two rows, 
you can always do like this function called tail over here and it will show you the two different uh, rows like this and uh, sometimes it is required to check all the how many null values are there and uh, since we just uh, did uh, we already fixed all these null values uh, and uh, if i just add some extra null values over here i already uh, full, uh, uh, fulfilled it with uh, some proper values so that's why you cannot see anything over here but if it has a null value you could see in here also so right now it does not have any null value and uh, in my instance but if you already have the instance the previous instance you can see like there is a uh, one null value in uh, this radius and another null value in perimeter over here uh, because uh, i already ran this thing after changing this uh, the file actually so that's what uh, it is doing uh, the important part is uh, there is a function called is null and if you just do like how many sales are null you can always uh, check in here and uh, right now we do not have any null function. And if you want to check the duplicated, you can always use this duplicated function over here and it will do like these uh, false uh, because there is no duplicated function. And if I want to introduce a duplication, let's say like in here, insert one row above. And if I just do this, so let me save it. And here, what I need to do is I have to run this once again because I need the updated version. So let me run all these things. And here, uh, I do not need to run all these, but let's say in here, and so this is the null and here if i just do that you will see that length is now 579 70 from 569 because uh, one row is basically duplicated all right so and here basically if you want to get the duplicated row you can just use this type of function again the same concept as numpy which one is duplicated it has all true in it and that's why you are getting all these things so df cancer then once again inside this uh, box bracket you have to write this df cancer duplicated and uh, that is about uh, the important uh, pre, pre important function for the information then there are several way to do the pre processing uh, where basically you can do a lot of different things to pre-process, uh, like uh, this is the same thing, uh, file. And uh, if you want to get rid of all the duplicates, so you can use this drop duplicates function. And uh, if you want to remove the null values, there is a function called drop na, and uh, there is something called in place which basically means that it will do everything in place. So, well, since uh, I think uh, I am running a little bit out of time, so let's do one thing, Dr. Lawler, what do you think? I mean, we can have another web uh, series uh, on these uh, pandas because we have several things that, uh, the, uh, that all the participants may find useful. Maybe next week or next of next week sometime. That sound good? So are you all okay with that? Because uh, I'm a little bit running out of time and there are several things that we may need to learn. Uh, I really do not need to uh, make it very fast, but since we are doing a workshop series, uh, we can learn it in the next week maybe. So, all right, so here, uh, just uh, play around with the little bit of pre-processing like duplicated data removal or null data dropping, uh, which are very important part. And then let's meet next uh, week uh, to learn more about these uh, pandas. So here, any question? All right, so I'm stop sharing and uh, Gregory uh, from ASF will uh, 
give you some presentation and introduction to AFA, ASF, uh, how they are using Python in their uh, facilities. So Gregory, please carry on. Yeah, I will need you to hit the security controls and turn on uh, host screen sharing for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, That's fine. There we go. And I can, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, so my name is Greg Short. I am a senior software engineer at the Alaska Satellite Facility. Um, you can see my details there. If you wanna contact me, I'm glshort at alaska.edu. Uh, this is gonna be just a short introduction to what ASF is and what we do and how we use some of these things that we've been looking at today. Um, I'm not actually teaching any Python today, uh, unfortunately. So uh, we'll just do a real quick intro here. Uh, if I can get to the next one. Okay, so uh, a little boilerplate just to, to introduce ASF. Um, uh, the, a the Alaska Satellite Facility is part of the Geophysical Institute of, uh, of UAF. And our, our motto is making remote sensing data accessible. So what do we actually do? Um, we, we downlink, process, archive, and distribute remote sensing data to uh, users around the world. Uh, and what that really means is we just collect data from uh, a number of platforms and uh, catalog it and make it accessible uh, through various uh, hosting venues and such for people to actually acquire the data and, and work with it. Uh, ASF promotes, facilitates, and participates in the advancement of remote sensing to support national and international earth science research, field operations, and commercial applications. And that's a mouthful, um, a heck of a mouthful. What it really means is we work with groups like this room, we work with firefighters, we work with volcanologists, we do sea ice tracking, uh, all sorts of, of uh, scientific pursuits. Um, we aim to support those through our data. And then uh, this last one, we just commit to doing it well and fast. So uh, I said data, data, data a bunch. I, I didn't really define that. So what sort of data does ASF work with? Uh, we primarily focus on synthetic aperture radar. Uh, a few of our platforms are the Sentinel-1 satellites. The that's uh, that's through ESA, the European Space Agency. Uh, we work with ALOS data, which is through JAXA, which is um, Japan. Uh, UAV SAR, uh, NISAR is one that's going to launch in the next year or so uh, through NASA. Uh, most of our platforms are frequently spaceborne, so we have satellites in orbit around the Earth, uh, and the SAR part of this is synthetic aperture part. Uh, the, the principle is that when you're doing radar data, uh, the larger an antenna you have, the better spatial resolution you can get. And so the, the synthetic part of that is that we use the, the motion of the satellite to simulate having a really large antenna, um, really large. So uh, some of our, our older data sets, the, the simulated or the synthetic size of that antenna is on the order of five kilometers. Um, some of the newer ones were approaching uh, a synthetic 10 kilometer uh, aperture, which is enormous. You can't really build that uh, physically. So, so that's the synthetic part of it. If you'd like to read more, um, I have a couple links in here. I, I understand these slides are going to get shared around um, after the talk here. So there's our, our own web page on, on uh, SAR and some information about it, frequently asked questions. And then, of course, the Wikipedia page on synthetic aperture radar is uh, extensive. So you're welcome to read that. Uh, so who am I? Uh, as I said, I'm Greg Short. I was born and raised in Sitka, Alaska, just like most other Alaskans. That uh, is a core part of my identity. Uh, I moved to Fairbanks around the turn of the century, which is unsettling to say. Uh, and I joined ASF as a student in 2005. Uh, and since then, I've been working with ASF as a software developer. Uh, I went fully remote in 2008. Uh, so uh, a couple of years ago when this pandemic hit, of course, you can imagine I was very much ready to continue working from home through that. Um, I fell in love with the scientific community through ASF and, uh, and found that the data we work with is just really neat. I, I enjoy it. I like big data products. Uh, I find it fascinating. We, we distribute something like, like three petabytes per month of data uh, to various scientific users, and I just find the whole thing fascinating. So. Python at ASF. Uh, we have three main Python development topics at ASF, uh, focusing on archival discovery and processing. And some of the, some very frequently used uh, libraries and frameworks that we, that we interact with. Uh, NumPy, as we've been looking at today, uh, Shapely is another one that we make a lot of use of for geospatial kind of stuff. Uh, Pandas, of course, we use 
we use that and it looks like we'll be getting into that next time. And then uh, Jupyter Lab, we're working with uh, Google, Google Collab here, but as I understand it, the back end of, of Collab is just Jupyter. Uh, and then honorable mention is the whole AWS uh, Amazon Web Services cloud framework. So we make a lot of use of that. So uh, working down that list of those three topics, ingest and archive, the main focus of that group is to accept incoming data uh, from the various agencies that, that uh, uh, control these satellites. And then we ingest that data to prepare it for archival and distribution, um, actually getting it into a form and a, a place where users, scientific users can download the data. Um, and then we work with internal and external systems to maintain the catalog. For instance, um, the, the NASA Common Metadata Repository maintains a, a grand view of all the various uh, uh, DACs, which is what we are, sorry, a Distributed Active Archive Center. It's, it's a NASA, uh, it's a NASA structure for, for interacting with all these products. Um, and storing them and such. So we work with, with those systems to maintain that catalog. And then we do a lot of cloud hosted Python. Uh, my group happens to be the discovery group. So I can give a little more detail here. We have a couple, a couple of flagship products. One of them being our uh, web application search engine, which uses an angular front end uh, for the actual client and then a Python backend. And that does all the heavy lifting. So when we're when we're in the context of a web application, we don't know what kind of computer the per, the user is going to be bringing to the mix. So we do the um, the actual hard stuff server side using uh, Python and some uh, libraries such as NumPy. And I actually added this link in during the talk because of some of the things that we were we were looking at. So real quick, I'll just pull this open. Obviously, we're not going to go through this code. I can make it a bit bigger here. Um, We'll just find NumPy. So here you can see, just just like uh, as was said in the in the talk here, importing NumPy um, as NP, which is the, the popular name for it. Uh, oops. And if we if I can do it here, there we go. So a few uh, just a few examples. We're doing the the NumPy arrays, um, uh, vector math. Uh, we've got some linear algebra later on in here uh, to do more vector operations. All sorts of stuff. This particular code, I think it's it's kind of interesting. What we're doing here is we are doing math to figure out where a satellite is in one of its orbits in relation to where it was in a previous orbit. In order to do some of the processes with this data, uh, you need to know what the difference is between these, these matching orbits. And so there's a bunch of math here involved. And of course, NumPy is absolutely the answer for that. So. Uh, if you want to look at this later on, you, you are welcome to follow these links. This is all open source uh, and available. And then similarly, we have a, uh, a Python module that does a lot of the same stuff as this web application uh, designed for direct programmatic use. And that makes use of tools such as NumPy, Shapely. Uh, it's made to work comfortably with pandas uh, and so on. And that also is available as a link there. Um, I did check. I, I, I had not used uh, Google Collab before, but uh, I just used uh, Jupyter Lab directly. Um, but as the pip install examples uh, that were that were shown earlier, uh, you can indeed install ASF search and play with this uh, directly in that environment. So uh, have at it there. Um, Additionally, we do a lot of processing of data. So this is kind of closer to the science side. Uh, one of our teams, our tools team, produces uh, a tool called Hype. It's the hybrid pluggable processing pipeline. Uh, and if you can say that five times fast, you win nothing. Uh, the vast majority of that system is Python based, does a lot of custom processing of science products on demand. It's all working in the cloud. Uh, and it allows ASF to process SAR data in a way that uh, wasn't previously possible. So this is all Python as well, and it uses a lot of those same tools. And then science too. Um, we have both in-house and, ex and out of house uh, external scientists, um, and they do a lot of work in Python. Uh, most commonly used libraries, again, are gonna be NumPy and Pandas and Shapely and, and JupyterLab. Uh, these are just really common tools uh, and we see them all the time. So if you wanna know more, uh, you can head to our website at asf.alaska.edu, and you can tune in for future talks. Uh, the notion, as I understand it, is that ASF will return with some actual Python content. Um, 
in the meantime, if you're feeling impatient, there is a link here to a seminar uh, that was recently done through NASA's Earth Data Group. Uh, and this, this actually covers uh, using that search module, ASF search that I mentioned previously. Um, and it, worked, it walks through a lot of the, uh, the same topics that were covered today, uh, but maybe with more like real data. You know, we, we had a lot of examples on working with various data structures and such today. Um, this actually works with some, some uh, science uh, type metadata that maybe is just fun to explore or play with. You're, you're welcome to walk through this. The examples used in this video are all uh, Jupyter, Jupyter notebooks and they're freely available. You could surely, to my knowledge, dump them right into Google Collab and uh, be off to the races. So always fun. Uh, and if you're interested in working with ASF, reach out. So it's, it's interesting to see some of the people that were here. Um, uh, it sounds like we got a lot of associates and researchers and such, and that's awesome. I know there's one student in the room actually physically. Uh, and as I wanted to say, as you proceed with your, your uh, CS work at, a, uh, at uh, UAF, uh, maybe you start looking for, for some work in the field, reach out to ASF. We have a really long and strong history with uh, students, um, case in point, 17 years ago. Uh, and so if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, either reach out to Kirk Hoganson, our, our ASF engineering manager, uh, you can reach out to me or you can just ask your instructor here and, and uh, they'll put you in touch with us. So I think that kind of covers it uh, just as a brief overview of uh, some of, of who may be returning for some future talks here. So uh, any questions? Okay, I will turn off sharing and you can have it back. Sorry, sorry for running long. Uh, uh, you'll email out the notebooks and stuff. That's the, the plan. Yes, I yeah. will share the entire notebook and the video lecture with all the participants and whoever has registered in uh, Google um, Google form. And uh, well, uh, we could not uh, finish the entire pandas part today, but uh, that uh, we will possibly offer an extension maybe next week or sometime and just to wait for the next email and uh, we will learn pandas in the next lecture in more detail. And yeah, so that's thank it. you for coming to the workshop. Sure. And, and, and uh, well, and well, uh, another thing, uh, thanks, Greg, for the wonderful introduction about ASF. And since many uh, professors and many leaders are here in this um, uh, workshop, I would like to request you all, if you have some showcase research uh, with the Python or re related to data science like R or any type of libraries, feel, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we are looking for good speaker. And if you have some kind of domain specific data science topic that you want to offer as a free workshop, we will be happy to accommodate you. So thank you. And the other thing that I would like to say at this point is uh, that uh, we are basically offering a data science course uh, called CSF 480, 6F680, which is a graduate and undergraduate level course, uh, data science, which is being offered as topic in computer science. So if you or uh, your students are interested, please ask them to register for this course. Thank you. See you in the next lecture. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.